um, and at the Business Journal. And I will um, let um, Brian introduce himself next before we get started. Hey, Leon, I'm uh, Brian Grossman. I'm editor in chief of the Colorado Springs Independent, the Business Journal, and the Military Newspaper Group. Um, Hi, nice to meet you. You too, and I'll pass it off to Glenn. And I'm Glenn Wallace. I am the uh, editor for the Southeast Express newspaper. Hi, Glenn. Great. Um, well, thank you for joining us today. Um, you are by now, I would say, a familiar face to most people, but I'll let you um, have a chance to talk about your background and qualifications in a moment. But first, let's talk about the job um, that you have right now. You recently said, um, I'm approaching 5,000 autopsies in my career and I've never once autopsied a dead person for the dead person. That's not the point. We do it because the things we learn from that death give us the information and the tools to prevent those same things happening to other people in the future. Can you talk about what that means in practice and in terms of programs and things that you've achieved? Yeah, so, um, you know, the work of the forensic pathologist medical examiner is to examine really the worst outcomes that we have in society, right? Um, statutorily, my job is to investigate the homicides, the suicides, the accidents, drugs, car crashes, child abuse, elder neglect, really kind of the, the truest, like the safety nets of society where everything went wrong. And in all of those cases, I'm not going to save someone's life. I'm the only doctor who is never going to save someone and, and, and bring them back to life and fix their problems or cure their disease. My job is to figure out what went wrong, um, why this person died, and then use that information to solve problems, help solve problems for everybody else. And if that's a criminal case, that means you know, the prosecution of the, the, the guilty party. Um, if it's a public health or safety threat, it's to take that information and provide it to policymakers, to public health, to um, elected officials, to law enforcement, to um, whoever that allows them to make changes in society that create a healthier, safer world. Every meaningful advance that we've had over the last hundred years, whether that's in the air we breathe or the water we drink or the cars we drive or the food we take in, or the, the, the streets we walk um, is at least in part because someone along the line, one of my predecessors um, took the time to figure out what happened and then use that information uh, to make the world a better place. And so, uh, you know, while this job on nearly every day can be devastatingly hard <laughs> to do, you always have to have that perspective of, yeah, today was a hard day, but what we did today can help save lives in the future. It's not going to save anybody's life today, but it can save, it can make the world better tomorrow. And as far as policy goes, um, you know, I think, I think the, the biggest one was back when we had our teen suicide epidemic that began in 2015. Um, that was an incredibly difficult time. We went from, you know, three to four teen suicides a year, which is tragic, but typical to you know, 14 and 15 teen suicides several years in a row, three years in a row, um, many of which were clustered with kids that knew each other in the same schools. And uh, we were making national media and national news about um, you know, Colorado Springs teen suicide capital. And, and that spurred efforts on, in my office, driven by, by myself, to delve deeper into what was going on with these kids. What was, what was different about these kids than what we had, had seen before? <clears throat> we secured grants, we worked with community partners, we then developed the Teen Suicide Prevention Working Group, which was basically brought together every youth-facing organization in the, in the city um, from various sectors and got to work on figuring out what those gaps were, what we could do to, to turn it around and bringing those partners together. Um, and this year, last year, 2021, we, despite a pandemic, despite, you know, skyrocketing rates of teen anxiety and depression and all the other challenges that this generation has, we were at four teen suicides for the year. Um, obviously the work we did isn't solely responsible for that, but it certainly plays a role in it. And, and those same efforts 
you know, collaborative community efforts have been applied to our opioid epidemic and now our fentanyl crisis. Um, and, and working with partners over the next few months, um, we're, we're hopefully launching with the UC Health a massive uh, veteran suicide prevention pilot program, um, which we hope to be a national model for how you provide services to not only veterans, but veterans families to, to support them through their mental illness and their struggle. So um, all of that begins with asking the questions of what went wrong here. Colorado is in the minority of states that's left with a, a very antiquated system that doesn't require candidates to have any death investigation training or any medical training in order to run for office, even though only pathologists can do autopsies under that same set of laws. What kind of problems does this create? Well, there's a there's a obviously a mismatch between what the requirements are to run for the job and what the requirements are to actually perform the job in a community our size. And so since 1966, El Paso County has had forensic pathologists as the elected coroners. That's only at the will of the voters. Um, and until really four years ago when I ran, no one had ever run against the coroner because everyone agreed that this was a nonpartisan, apolitical, position that should be based on qualifications. But we live in a very different time now. And um, the reality is, is to do this job in El Paso County requires you to lead a team of 10 board certified death investigators, half of which have master's degrees in this field, lead a team of five additional board certified forensic pathologists who have spent 13 years after high school training as physicians and forensic scientists, scientists do this job. And then third, it requires you to run the state's only in-house forensic toxicology laboratory with four forensic wow. toxicologists, many of which have master's degrees. And yet the qualifications to run for the job are so minimal that there is literally no way a lay person could get elected to this position and then actually have any anything that they could do or contribute <laughs> to the office. Um, the truth is, is we're probably 30 to 40 years in this office past the point where the laws account for what you would need to have skills and training wise to, to do the job. Um, you know, there's an, there's the, and, and part of that is driven by the fact that there is a national shortage of forensic pathologists. There's not enough of us out there uh, in America to do this job. Um, and so there's this pushback between what we all know should happen with death investigation in Colorado and what's re what's the reality of what can be accomplished because of this, the crisis of, of work shortage. And so what the state has done over the last several decades is evolve kind of naturally from that antiquated coroner system in Southern Colorado to a regional medical examiner, where you have a medical examiner at the top who then, who then funnels all of that work and oversees it and supports those coroners through the rest of Colorado. But all of that, the survival of that system requires that the person in El Paso County is a board certified forensic pathologist, despite once again, the fact that the laws in no way <laughs> live up to what the community really needs and should expect. Is what happened over the past year a wake-up call that maybe the laws need to be changed? I know that's not really a um, not really a coroner question, but it's not. But but it is at the same time. My my hope is is that the current situation we find ourselves in, um, the current um, choice that voters have in this upcoming election, in the very clear difference between the qualifications of the two candidates, not even in this race, but four years ago when I ran in the general election as well. My goal, my hope is that that will shine enough attention um, and be a wake up call that this has to get changed. Um, it is long past time for, um, for the laws concerning the coroner to be what they are. And if there is a positive outcome, from this particular race, um, it is that, that it, it has garnered attention 
not just locally, but even nationally as to the problems with death investigation throughout, obviously, El Paso County, Colorado, and in many other states. Um, we are truly in a crisis situation when it comes to uh, medical legal death investigation in the U.S. If you follow any news in other places like Mississippi or Baltimore, um, we're fortunate in El Paso County to have what we have, the resources we have and the, the expertise, but um, that's not guaranteed to stay that way if we leave the laws the way that they are. The triple boarded in anatomic, forensic, and clinical pathology. Can you um, talk for the layperson about what those qualifications really mean and how they're important to your role? Yeah, and to so, running and to running everything. Yeah, so you know, I'm a I have a bachelor's of science in biology from Indiana University, and then I went to medical school at at Indiana University School of Medicine, and then decided I wanted to be a pathologist and a pathologist is defined as the study of disease. So we're the doctors who essentially make diagnoses. And there's two ways you make diagnoses in medicine. One is by physically examining the, the body and the tissue, which is what we call anatomic pathology. And anatomic pathologists usually make diagnoses through the examination of tissue, both grossly as well as microscopically. So you have a lump in your breast or you have a funny looking mole on your skin. You go to your doctor, your doctor does a biopsy or cuts it out. They then provide that to the pathologist who looks at it under the microscope and then informs your doctor, the clinician or your surgeon, you know, what you have. Is it, is it malignant? Is it cancer? What type? What, what grade? What all of that that guides treatment? And that's anatomic pathology. Part of that is also doing autopsies on folks who die and, and then informing their family and, their, and the doctors what you found. The other way you make diagnoses in, patho in medicine is through the laboratory sciences, right? You've got an infection and they do a culture. Or you've got, um, you know, your white counts off or your platelets are low. And so they do testing to see if you have a blood cancer, a leukemia, lymphoma. Um, you have to manage the blood bank to replace someone who's blood products for someone who's bleeding. All of that is what we call clinical pathology. So clinical pathologists run all of the laboratory sciences. And then every single organ and body system has its own pathologists who go on to do additional training, what we call fellowships, that just deal with that. So we have pathologists who go on to do additional training who only look at prostate. That's all they do. Or they only look at breast. Or they only do hematopathology. Or they only do derm. One of those subsets of pathology is forensic pathology, where you go on and do an additional year of training, a fellowship. And in that fellowship, you do forensic autopsies every day, which are deaths that occur suddenly, unexpectedly, or of, of violence. Um, but then you also learn all the other forensic sciences like firearms and ballistics and blood spatter and DNA and trace evidence. And you learn how to testify as an expert witness in court. And you learn how to do you know, mass graves and uh, grid searches and how to evaluate plane crashes and all the things that no other doctor knows how to do or would never have any reason to do. And in forensic anthropology and the examination of bones and things like that. Um, and so at each step of the way, you know, you can take tests at medical school, then you take tests um, for your board exams, and then you take tests after your fellowship. And so to prove competency. And so I'm board certified in all three of those areas. Why that's important is, is because part of my job is, you know, I got a microscope right here. And so part of my job is look through that microscope and make diagnoses, right? Um, doing physical autopsies, um, but then also running a forensic toxicology laboratory, which would fall under the umbrella of clinical pathology. You train how to run a laboratory, how to interpret, how to make sure the, 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 the testing is appropriate um, and is being done to the highest quality. And then obviously the entire forensic side of it, um, working with law enforcement, district attorney, and doing crime scene death investigation and um and all of that stuff so to sit in this position that i'm in requires you to have that broad level of expertise in all of those areas because all of it is necessary to ultimately figure out how and why people die which is the statutory responsibility of the elected coroner you've said that the set of qualifications that you have um actually saves el paso county a lot of money. Can you explain that? Yeah, so there are kind of three responsibilities here of, of, of historically what the coroner has done. And that's not just me, Dr. Bucks, the previous coroner, Dr. Bowerman, the coroner before that, which takes us back to, I think, about 1980. Um, to do all three of those things, 
requires one, you have to be the elected coroner, right? Because we live in Colorado and that's it. Um, that's kind of the administrative responsibilities of, of determining who does and doesn't get autopsied and, and running the office. Um, but to determine the cause and manner of death, which is a statutory responsibility, you require autopsies, as you mentioned earlier, in nearly all cases in, in the forensic setting. So the elected coroner can't do their job without the forensic pathologist. Statutorily, the, I think the, the coroner is paid like 123,000 or 122,000, something like that in level one counties. And so you have that salary of 120-ish thousand dollars. The medical examiner, which has to be there because I have to do autopsies, the current salary range for a chief medical examiner in this in, in, in a city our size is probably somewhere between 300 and you know $360,000 based on the jobs that are opening now that you that are in this part of the country. And then you also have to have someone run a toxicology lab. That either has to be a clinical pathologist such as myself or it has to be a PhD forensic toxicologist. The jobs that are currently open right now for that are somewhere between probably around $150,000. And so when you add all three of those up, the 120 plus let's say the 350 plus the 150, I don't know what that comes up to, but probably around 600,000, you'd have to have hire three people of over six, around $600,000 to do three separate jobs that me, Dr. Box and Dr. Bowerman all did for less than $300,000. And so just that alone, saves the county almost half because you've got one person with the expertise of essentially three people. There's not very many of us left that have that broad of an expertise because as we all know in medicine, the trend is going towards narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, but as of now, all three jobs can be done. Um, and the truth is, is for, the, for this office, the coroner piece, the only thing that I do as quote unquote coroner is get elected. <laughs> Everything else, every other thing I do on a daily basis falls under the purview of the medical examiner. There's really nothing that the coroner, quote unquote, would do here other than, you know, maybe the budget, but most of that is still being driven by the doctors and the salaries and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what I'm doing here is, is, even, is even broader than what Dr. Crusoe up in Denver is doing, who is a you know, appointed chief medical examiner. He doesn't have to run for election there, but they don't have a tox lab. I have that additional piece that I have to deal with. So you start there. And then the other piece of it is that here in El Paso County, we have six, we have five full-time, including myself, and then one part-time forensic pathologist. So we have essentially six forensic pathologists that work on, you know, in this office under five under me. Um, most of the state and much of the country that has coroner systems have to have to provide that autopsy service through contracts with private practice practitioners, right? And so you're a forensic pathologist, you own your own company, you then contract with a coroner who's not a forensic pathologist, and they pay you every time you do an autopsy. So for each autopsy you do, you get paid specifically for it. And you can do that when, you're num when your volume's low. We all know in government, if you have something that's not often done, it's often more economical to outsource it. Once you reach a certain threshold, everything, it's cheaper to do everything in-house. And so everyone here is paid a fixed salary, regardless of how many autopsies they do. We charge the 20 plus other counties that we do autopsies for, we charge them $1,500 per autopsy. If you contract, what you do is you pay the doctor $1,500 for autopsy. What we do here is we bring in the $1,500 for autopsy from the out of counties, and then we hand that over to the general countywide fund, which goes to them. I don't keep it. My staff doesn't keep it. My budget doesn't even keep it. It all gets put back in the, in the general pot. What happens if we were to lose our, a, our forensic pathology staff and have to transition to that contract model now you've got, well, what did we do? We did 1,440 autopsies last year times 1,500. You know, our salaries now, that, that cost to taxpayers almost doubles. Well, essentially slightly more than doubles um, because now you're paying for each autopsy instead of salaried employees. Um, and so the, that model doesn't work when you've got large volumes of cases which is why no one else in the country would, would, that has big volumes goes to that if they have a choice. Unfortunately, because of the shortage, there are places in the country that have had to go to that model. 
And so not only does it having this, this current situation that we have save on the coroner position, but it dramatically also saves because you have medical examiners to work under a chief medical examiner. No other place in Colorado, no other county is a non-physician pathologist coroner elected who has medical examiners on staff. In every other place where you have a non-forensic pathologist elected coroner, you have to go to that contract model because forensic pathologists, it's far more lucrative to have that model than it is to have what we have, which is because no forensic pathologist would then agree to work underneath someone who is, it's like you wouldn't get a job as a cardiologist for someone who's not a cardiologist. It makes no sense. Um, and so the, the, the situation we have here is unique for us. Um, and without that medical examiner as the coroner, you would undoubtedly have to switch to a contract model. So the role of coroner has changed over a lot of years. These days, what does a community need um, from its coroner? Or I know you just mentioned that, you know, what you do as coroner is get elected um, and that you work more as medical examiner. So answer that from whichever side you want, but what's needed today? I think I think it has it has transitioned. My, I I believe it's transitioned. And my goal from when I started here in 2008, and then certainly when I transitioned to the elected coroner, was historically what would happen is deaths would occur, bodies were brought into a, a you know a coroner medical examiner, cases were done, and cause and manner were spit out, and that was it. Everything that happened inside the building was largely a black box. And whatever you chose to do with that information as a community, that was on you. Um, my focus has been a much more community-wide engagement and an advocate for what was happening. It's no longer in my mind good enough to just say, here's what people died from. If you aren't gonna then take that information and actively engage with your elected officials, with your public health department, with your media, um, and highlight these issues and use these tragedies as catalysts for improvement. This job to me is, it's way too hard and depressing to be honest with you, if you aren't going to leverage what you've learned to make a difference. And that isn't probably the case in most places, um, even still, but I think in many medical examiner's office, it is moving in that direction. For the medical examiner not to be this kind of unknown entity out here, but rather a partner with the community in helping solve problems. Um, starts with pointing them out, but then also helping, helping solve those problems. Um, and I have used the position of this office certainly to highlight issues like teen suicide and you know fentanyl crisis um, and others including the pandemic which is certainly at least in large part <laughs> why I am in the situation I am in right now in this election um, because I did become, for several reasons, one, because of my role as coroner, but also because I did volunteer to help and assist with public health in the county's um, efforts against the pandemic. Um, no doubt become a much more high profile individual than what either our previous coroners have been and certainly coroners in other places. That, yeah, that sort of goes to um, the next question that I was going to ask, you know, in your job, you work with the um, public health with El Paso County Public Health. You work with law enforcement, um, and I wanted to know about how those collaborations work, and about that. Um, how much more high profile to most people um, you became um, because of COVID, um, and how you navigated that um, in what's supposed to be not a very political role, but in a very political landscape. Yeah. Um... So historically, um, I had a very good working relationship with, with public health. We, um, the public, not only the public health director and previous directors, but, but the staff, and that grew in large part out of our efforts with teen suicide. Um, about 2014, the state legislator passed a bill that pushed uh, child fatality, which I was on the governor appointed 
um, child fatality. Of, I was a governor appointed position to the state child fatality review team, I think in 2012. And then the goal was around 2014 to push that from a kind of statewide Denver centric model to local and regional reviews of child deaths because the belief which I agreed with and still do that if you wanted to use these deaths to make change and put in intervention strategies, the best people to have at the table to have the discussion were the people that had the boots on the ground in that community, right? They knew what was going on. They had the relationships they could put in the prevention efforts. And so that transition. So part of that was every county had to form their own local child fatality review team. And, and I partnered with public health and we created that team together and then brought in the DA and law enforcement and schools and all the other groups that had to come. And so through the formation of that, I, 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 I began to work very closely with our public health partners. And then that evolved into the teen suicide and all the upstream efforts there. And so, um, you know, we were kind of, we, it's a natural fit between us, the coroner's office medical examiner and, and public health and um, collaborated on numerous, you know, projects with them and shared data, if not daily, it certainly very, very frequently. Um, and, and then um, when the pandemic came in March of 2020, um, I was asked early in the month before it kind of really ramped up, but the county was preparing for the inevitability and what we were seeing happening in other places. We as elected officials met and went over what the plan was for the county. And during those conversations, I was asked, I was kind of half asked, half volunteered, hey, if this gets bad, would you be willing to take a more active role, a leadership role in in the county's response. And I said, of course, that's I'm elected. My job is to help keep the community safe and whatever you guys need from me, I'm going to do it. And um, and then when March 3rd to no March 11th came, which was the day they, you know, Trump closed travel and the NBA shut down and Tom Hanks got COVID and it, like it was the end of every, you know, it was like that was the tipping point. Um, the public health director, who I was very good friends with and had worked with very much said, hey, you remember when you volunteered to help like with the COVID response, I was like, yeah, like five hours ago. And she's like, yeah. I said, oh yeah. She's like, well, can you help tomorrow? Can you be here? We have to meet with the mayor to talk about, you know, the St. Patrick's Day parade. And I said, yeah, whatever you need from me. And and I showed up and I think that was the 12th. And by I think noon or the afternoon, they had officially deputized me as the deputy medical director of public health department to help run the COVID response. Um, I, it was a completely volunteer position. I did not ever get paid a penny for it. Um, and so that point forward for the next 10 and a half months, um, I assisted the county law enforcement, you know, schools, uh, various government agencies, uh, businesses, everybody and help navigating the pandemic. And I did both roles, ran the coroner's office and still did autopsies and still was here. I'd do that in the day, in the morning. Um, and then I'd spend my afternoons and my evenings and my weekends helping run public health response. Um, and I did that until uh, the end of January, 2021, once the vaccines were out and being deployed, um, I felt at that point I could step away and come back to just doing this job. Um, and I officially resigned at that point. And, and then they were kind of, you know, they're great people over there. So um, what little contribution I made, um, they were certainly in a place where they could continue on without me. But one of my responsibilities was um, largely communicating what was happening, what we were seeing, what we were doing, what the plan was to the broader community, um, to the media and others, which put me in kind of the public facing a person of the COVID response. And so many of our citizens and others frustrations, um, which are legitimate frustrations, got voiced, uh, I think were somewhat focused on me. Um, I often equate it to being mad at the weatherman who for the tornado that's coming because he's the one that got on the TV and told you it was coming. Regardless of the fact that he doesn't have any control over the tornado, right? Um, and that's just part of that responsibility, unfortunately. Um, among challenges ahead, you've um, mentioned veteran suicide, teen suicide, 
fentanyl, mental health. Um, are there others looming that aren't on the radar for a lot of the population? Maybe people aren't noticing yet. Um, that's the end of my question. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I, mean, I think I think you know fentanyl would have been a bigger story the last several years if it weren't for you know a global pandemic that we were dealing with. But it was always happening there in the background, um, and it pre predated by many years um, the pandemic. Um, and so that I think is going to continue to probably be the number one story. And out of fentanyl, which fentanyl's not, we call it fentanyl, but it's really multiple drugs that are all analogs and cousins of each other. And that will can that situation will continue to evolve. And based on what we're seeing this year already we haven't seen the worst of it. It's, it's going to grow worse. Um, things that are not yet on people's radars, I think, um, you know, we have, we are seeing excess deaths of nearly every category um, across the nation. And that's not, and, and as well as we are seeing here. I think our suicides have stayed steady though. I mean, I know that our suicides have stayed steady the last two years. And I think that's a testament to kind of efforts um, that have made nationally and locally. Um, but there may be a very difficult period kind of looming out there. I think another thing that I, I have, my, my annual report should be coming out next week, is a lot of these like what we call the diseases of despair, substance abuse, chronic alcoholism, just kind of overall general deterioration of the quality of people's lives. Um, we are seeing increases in all of those types of deaths, sort of unhealthy coping strategies by individuals that are going to continue to take their toll. And then we are up um, on our homicides, which we know that, you know, violent crime um, is up across the country. So we're seeing that here as well. You know, we're, we're a bigger city, we're growing. And so those problems come with it. And, um, but I think one of the things that is not appreciated that I am, I, I, I spoke about it last year, and I'm going to try to speak maybe more on it. Um, is is the presence of you know domestic and family violence. So, of our of our 61 homicides in El Paso County last year, 27 27 of them were domestic and family violence. You know, one of them obviously was the six who died in the the mass shooting that was um, at the birthday party. Um, so that's a big piece of it. But it's more than double any other category, which is the next one down is like altercation, which is usually two drunk guys who get in a fight and one of them has a gun or a knife. Um, I, I think that's that's like an unspoken or undiscussed plague in our world that unhealthy families and unhealthy relationships um, and poor coping strategies with the stresses of life, which unfortunately we can't control that component of it, um, is really what's driving what people end up out of coroner's office from violence. Um, and obviously those are big issues that require massive upstream efforts. But it, it, to me, nearly everything I see here, whether it's homeless deaths or you know domestic violence or substance abuse or suicides, obviously, um, almost all of it boils down to mental health and untreated or undertreated uh, mental health and not necessarily even severe mental health, not schizophrenics, not, but just, people who don't have the, the, the emotional and mental tools to navigate um, the stresses of the modern world in a, in a productive and healthy way. And that poor coping just compounds their problems, whether it's substance abuse or you know, violence or whatever. Um, and that seems to be, and that seems to, it is growing, um, I think in our community. Um, I think the other piece, and this gets kind of beyond what is the scope of my job, but I, as the coroner, you expect a little bit of weirdness in your everyday life. <laughs> it is what we do here. But the level of um, detachment from reality by some components of the community um, that is directed oftentimes at my staff or myself um, and the accusations of lying and corruption and covering up deaths and you know, you get paid money for this or that. 
um, isn't anything I think any public servant has ever seen. And that certainly takes its toll on the people who are really here to help. I mean, we're walking into the worst imaginable tragedies day in and day out. And then to then be confronted with completely baseless accusations about things because they saw it on the internet and aggressively so. Um, I get I get letters, I've gotten letters in my home um, of from individuals who um, somehow believe that they're like the sovereignty people that believe that they don't live in America and that there's a magic pot of gold out there. And I mean, I got, I can show you, I got, I got this guy sent me a letter like two weeks ago and he literally like tapes his hair to it um, and sends it and weird fingerprints all over it. And this stuff is happening all the time. I've gotten letters from people that stuff them with like glitter so that when you open it, they like the glitter flies all over you. And <laughs> you're kind of like, man, I'm just trying to like help like babies not get abused. Like why, how did I and my staff um, and our first responders and our doctors have the, how did we turn out to be the bad guys here? And that is going, and we see it on the kind of law enforcement end too. The sheriff talks about all the time about recruiting and all this kind of stuff. And it, it makes a very, very difficult job even harder. Um, I think we have, I think the average citizen um, underestimates uh, the, the, the kind of treacherous uh, period we are in with what, what some folks in our community truly believe is happening and how we navigate out of that, um, I don't know. Um, because it's certainly from the ground level here has, ha makes, as I said, a very difficult job, much, much harder to do. I've just got one more question before I'll um, see if Brian or Glenn yeah. um, have anything, but this does go to what um, I was going to ask you about next, which is um, leadership. There's a lot of facets that you're handling. You know, you've got this public facing role, you're interacting with law enforcement, medical professionals, um, people who are in crisis every day, people who are hostile to what you're doing. You still need to have a bedside manner, even though you don't have patients, I suppose. Um, how does your leadership style encompass all those demands? And um, how would you describe the way that you lead in all those areas? Um, yes, there are um, numerous demands on whoever sits in this position. Um, from the, from the community and from our community partners, for sure. We, we play a, a, a crucial link um, and it is unique because I, I, you know, whoever has this job has sort of, you only have two feet, but you've got like one foot in the criminal justice system with law enforcement, with the district attorney and helping in our public defenders, um, helping them understand and navigate the science of it. Um, and then you've got kind of one foot in the public health realm um, and helping sort of the broad perspective of improving the quality of life. And you've got a foot in sort of the policy, political elected official sign and informing them and making sure they have the information that they need to help make good change. And then also you are a member of the medical community. I meet once a month at the UC Health has a trauma conference where they go over all their trauma cases and the cases we've done autopsies on. I relay to them the findings so that they can help improve patient care and fix issues there. Um, and then you certainly have, you know, a piece with the media that you, I'm, I am the one that brings you all the information that helps you tell the stories you need to tell. Um, so it, it, it's a lot. Um, and so I think my my leadership style um, is, you know, different certainly than my predecessor, Dr. Bucks, who was my mentor and 
um, you know, very much a, a father figure to me, which is that um, I'm a very engaged um, an active engager with all of these community partners. Um, and then inside this building, you know, my expectations have been always and clearly voiced that, you know, our job here is to be responsive to the community. And I have a philosophy, I have a statement that no matter who calls and says, do you have this? Can you help with this? The answer is yes, 100% of the time. Um, and so whether that's public defenders or the DA's office or media or, you know, a citizen who has questions about a particular issue, we're going to provide everything that we can to them, um, which does place a lot of demands on my staff and, and what this office can do. Um, one of those things is we're within a few months, hopefully I've been working on this for like three years of a new laboratory information system that allows us to query data and data requests at a much more real time way than, you know, on a piece of paper or on an Excel spreadsheet that we have to do by hand. Um, and there are certainly times where I'm like, wow, I should have just kept my head down and said nothing. <laughs> did this the old way. I've only brought myself problems and misery. But, um, but, but to me, that's the core value of this office is we are here to help um, provide information. And I've taken a very different approach with the media and the community, and that's as fully transparent as I can possibly be. And the first one of the first things I did when I took when I was elected was we had an, a media day where we invited all the local media to come in and watch autopsies. Um, and we've done it again. We did it, you know, I don't know, maybe a year ago, six nine months ago, something like that, because um, we had a lot of changeover and we brought people in and and let them watch autopsies. The more this is your coroner's office, the more you know about it, um, I think the better informed you are, and you know you better, you understand the importance of this position. I, I, my job isn't here to hide anything. Uh, my job is to provide whoever wants the information, the information. I'm not the gatekeeper to, um, to what, what people should or shouldn't know. Um, people make good decisions when they're better informed. Um, and that's what my philosophy has been. So to that point, you're sort of, you sit at this intersection of or maybe you are the intersection of law enforcement, um, information on domestic violence, um, or encountering, you know, the results of that public health, suicide, mental health. And you were talking about the importance of um, data. Um, where does data on gun violence and gun deaths come into that? And how, um, how much do you share on that? And how much do um, those organizations you know, reflect on that or ask you for that information? Yeah, so um, what I've done over the years with my annual report, which is really the, the, the biggest kind of data dump that I do per year, and some stuff I can do along the year, but it's really, it, it's really the opportunity to really kind of lay out an entire year's worth of what's going. And then you have a kind of a, a standard from, this is what happened this year, this is what happened last year and the year. And I took that over, I don't know, maybe 2014, 2015. Um, and it's grown every year. And it, what grows it and drives it often is media requests or part, community partner requests. Hey, do you have more information on this? Um, and so, I don't know, three or four years ago, um, you know, I was asked a lot about gun violence and what was going on. And so I actually, in my annual report, I have an entire page um, that I dedicate to um, gun violence and what we're seeing. Uh, and that has grown a little bit. Um, there is a group, uh, the Firearms Safety Task Force, I think is their name, but it's it's co co run by UC Health. Um, doc, uh, uh, what is his name? Um, um, oh, it's blanking on me right now. Um, it's run by 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 UC Health and um, other community partners. And so what we do with them is they come in every year and they go through all of our firearms deaths. Um, and they are able to, and I give them full access to the reports and, and, and the narratives, the background information, um, and they can data mine the entire thing 
And then they then issue an annual report that's specific to firearms, firearms deaths. And out of that has grown, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a firearms like safety video that they did in conjunction with PD and the sheriff's office and others. Much of the data that's in there came out of, of our, our reports and our, our investigative data that, that we, we use. One of the things that we did when the teen suicide was happening is historically like the core medical examiner corner, your job was to figure out was, was it self-inflicted or not? And you would ask the questions until you were satisfied with that answer. And then you stopped, you wouldn't move on in your life. But when we had that, we needed, not only did they do it to themselves, but why, what was the entire story here? And so I created this thing called the child self-injury tool, which is basically a giant form that my investigators would fill out that gave everything like how they're doing in school, their friends, social media, LGBTQ plus issues, like, you know, um, discriminate any, any of those things that would itch and contribute right to this decision. Um, and then part of that obviously was means restriction and finding out, you know, what they use, where they got it, how it was stored, all that kind of stuff to better inform prevention efforts. And so it has progressed over the last probably four or five years from very little data to really, really robust data. Now we can't always find everything um, because these are chaotic situations. And a lot of times people don't know, you know, where they got the gun or how long they bought it or, you know, where they stored the ammunition or whatever, um, particularly in adults. Um, you know, some of these people don't have friends or family that can inform us and the person who knows is no longer with us. So it's not 100% complete, but it's, it's pretty good. It's certainly way better than it has been. So that's the kind of, I think that's the better questions I ask, the better equipped all those other community partners are to do something about it. And that's a good example. Uh, I know we're running a bit short on time now, but I want to check to see if um, Brian or Glenn, um, do you guys have any questions? I think, I, Len, did you have anything? Uh, just one. You mentioned that from a technical standpoint, if a layman was elected to your position, there'd be virtually nothing they could do in terms of interacting on a technical basis with your staff uh, to do a lot of what you do. Um, from a political or outward facing information point um, standpoint, what would, what would be the, the damage in that regard? Well, um, the elected official um, has the full statutory responsibility to um, put on the death certificate, the cause and manner, whatever they want. So I can do an autopsy or my staff can do an autopsy and say, you know, this is the cause, this should be the manner. But the coroner or the elected politician can overrule those findings and put whatever they want on. Um, and that happens in some places, other corners are sick. There's been very high profile situations where medical examiners rule particular cause and manners. And then the elected non pathologist coroner for political reasons or alleged political reasons from the forensic pathologist standpoint, um, changes it and puts something else there. And so that data is what goes to the state and to the CDC and helps drives a lot of these things. You, you, you certainly won you don't want someone who doesn't have any training or experience in investigating deaths and determining cause and manner of death to be the ultimately the one who's filling that out. And then two, you certainly don't want someone whose clear motivation is a political agenda, right? Um, so that, that would be the biggest danger from a public facing standpoint is, is, you know, these are medical decisions. It's a medical opinion what goes on a cause it goes on a death certificate. It should be driven by physicians who are qualified to make that determination. Um, I think also, um, you know, a, a big piece in this, in the, with the knowledge that we have crisis shortage of forensic pathologists, um, it would make retainment, retention and recruitment of quality forensic pathologists to our region of the state from around the country, essentially impossible. Um, and, and then the, the, from that point, both citizens and taxpayers will suffer if we don't have um, the ability to recruit and retain quality forensic pathologists to this, to this area. Because we're in a world where uh, every forensic pathologist could quit today and find another job tomorrow for probably for more money. And so it comes down to not what your salary is, but leadership. Um, um, 
uh, and um, stability and uh, the reputation of the office. Medicine is probably probably like journalism where, yeah, you want to get paid, but you also want to go to the place where you can learn under the best that has a proud, long tradition of doing things the right way um, so that you can then work your way up, you know, um, to more, even more prestigious positions. Um, and, and that's how it is, certainly in, in forensic pathology. You go where the, the most respected and stable and uh, medical examiner, chief medical examiners are, and then you work in, under them and you grow in your career. Um, and so from a certain, tr certainly trust from the community, um, I think would be negatively impacted. If, if it was a politician, a, a, a certainly a partisan politician in this position as opposed to um, a medical examiner. Gwen, did you have anything else? No, it for me. Dr. Kelly, thank you so much for your time today. I'm gonna to let Brian talk to us about when the endorsements are coming out and when the videos are going online. Uh, videos are going up pretty much right away. Oh, am I muted? Nope. Uh, videos are going up pretty much right away. Uh, endorsements will be out mid-June, uh, obviously before the election. Um, I'll give you a, sort of a range. Uh, around the 15th, I believe. So uh, you could look for endorsements then. Um, and I think it's funny that you said that uh, journalism is sort of like medicine. I think I've also gotten letters filled with human hair. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's strange, but it does bring me comfort that I'm not alone. Yeah, you know, yeah. there are others. Yeah, company. Same things. Yeah. So, yeah, we appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, and thanks for everything you do.